Gaul united, forming a single nation, animated by a common spirit, can defy the universe. So reads the inscription of a French monument dedicated to the ancient Gallic leader Vercingetorix. The monument was built in 1865 and was essentially a piece of unifying propaganda by the French emperor of the time, Napoleon III. The character that the monument reveres is a fascinating one, however, as he led one of the most famous revolts against Rome in history. The story starts in 52 BC, when Julius Caesar had briefly left Gaul and was in northern Italy, at a secluded spot in a Gallic woodland. Celtic leaders met to discuss the situation with Rome, which was in control of a large percentage of Gaul after six years of war. The Gallic leaders expressed their anger at the fate of Akko, the former leader of the Senonese, a Gallic tribe. The previous year, in 53 BC, Julius Caesar had tried and convicted Akko of treason after the Gallic leader had inspired his people to fight against the Romans. As punishment, Akko had been publicly flogged to death in front of other Celtic chieftains, undoubtedly to send a message. Needless to say, this had left a bitter taste in Celtic mouths and ultimately inspired rebellion. As Caesar wrote in his commentaries, the Celtic leaders decided that it was better to die in battle than to resign themselves to the loss of their ancient military glory and the liberty inherited from their ancestors. The meeting ended after the Gallic leaders took an oath to stand by their fellow Celts against Rome, and it was decided that the Carnute tribe, which meant the horned ones in Gaulish, probably in reference to their helmets, would be the first to strike. The Carnute attack occurred in Senabu, which is modern day Orleans in north central France, when they attacked the Roman force stationed on their territory. The news of the attack spread rapidly through Gaul, fueling a spirit of revolt. The young Vercingetorix of the Arvini tribe was one who proselytised the spirit, inspiring his fellow Celts to rebel. His uncle disagreed, however, feeling that it was too risky to oppose Rome, and expelled his nephew from the town of Gergovia. Undeterred, Vercingetorix began rallying his fellow Celts from the surrounding countryside, and soon after, he was named King of the Arvini tribe. In the following weeks, he managed to unify a whole range of Gallic tribes behind him, and he was elected Commander-in-Chief of the Gallic Resistance. Caesar, a biased source of course, described Vercingetorix as a man of boundless energy and stoic discipline, yet this was mixed with a brutal streak. Vercingetorix was from an interesting family. His powerful father, Celtalus, had been killed by his fellow Gauls after trying to declare himself king of all of Gaul. Vercingetorix soon raised an army, however, using strict discipline to maintain order. According to Caesar, Vercingetorix punished this loyalty by torture and death, and was even said to cut his troops' ears off or gouge out one of their eyes to maintain discipline. In his campaign against the occupying Roman force, Vercingetorix employed scorch earth tactics. In a council of war in 52 BC, Vercingetorix told his fellow Celts that we must strive by every means to prevent the Romans from obtaining forage and supplies. Along the enemy's line of march, we must burn all the villages and farms within the radius that the foragers could cover. His soldiers duly obliged, burning as many as 20 towns in one day along the Roman line. This strategy worked relatively well for a period, as the Gauls managed to make Caesar's campaign arduous for a time. Vercingetorix was further emboldened after his forces successfully managed to defend Gergovia, an important fortified town of the Arvini tribe, against a Roman siege. Caesar himself 
estimated that 700 Roman soldiers, including 46 centurions, were killed at the Battle of Gergovia, but the actual figure is likely to be in the thousands. Caesar was eventually forced to retreat and he was pursued by Vercingetorix's forces. This pursuit did not last long, however, with Vercingetorix soon forced to retreat to the town of Elysia. The Gallic force was estimated to number around 80,000 soldiers. Caesar soon arrived in Elysia and decided that the best tactic was to encircle the town with a series of fortifications, aiming to deprive the Gauls of supplies. This is one interesting aspect of Roman soldiers. They appear to be half soldiers, half construction workers, as they routinely managed to complete large construction projects with seemingly little effort. It is estimated that the Romans built 16.7 kilometers of fortifications around Elysia. Caesar's strategy to starve the Gauls out from Elysia was correct, as Vertingetorix only had around 30 days of rations for his men. The Celtic leader soon sent word for a Gallic relief army to be sent from surrounding areas. When Caesar learned of the plan for a Gallic relief army, the Roman general instructed his forces to build a second circle of defences, this time to protect the Romans from the relief army. His troops duly obliged, building yet more fortifications around their position. Shortly after, the massive Gallic relief army arrived, totaling 250,000 men. In the following days, the Gauls attacked the Romans from both directions and just about found a weak spot in the Roman fortifications. There was a gap in the outer Roman fortifications due to a steep hill, and the Gauls took advantage, concentrating massive numbers at this point. Despite some initial Gallic success, Caesar acted swiftly when realising this strategic vulnerability and managed to patch this up. After stabilising, the Romans routed the Gauls, leading many to flee. This was a devastating defeat for Gallic independence. The following day, the Gallic leaders inside Elysia met to discuss their position. According to Caesar, Vercingetorix addressed the meeting. He said that he had not undertaken the war for private ends, but for national liberty. And since I now accept my fate, I place myself at your disposal. Make amends to the Romans by killing me, or surrender me alive as you think best. They decided to hand Vercingetorix over to Caesar and to surrender. Vercingetorix was placed in Roman chains and imprisoned. Years later, between 49 and 46 BC, Vercingetorix was paraded through the streets of Rome during one of Caesar's triumphs and was then beheaded. Despite his death and defeat, Vercingetorix remains a symbol of national liberty throughout France and the world.